Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm the City Kids Director at City Church. We care about your kids and we want to invest in them even when they can't be in a City Kids class. So each week we have a fun and engaging lesson for them to watch at home, plus resources that they can use all throughout the week. Check out the City Kids webpage for details or text KIDS to the number below to check it out. What's up guys? Welcome to City Church Online. My name is Maddie. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you are new to City Church, we would love for you to take a minute and fill out our digital connect card available either in the chat on the online platform or you can text new to the number below and we will donate $5 in your honor to a feeding center that we help to support in the Philippines. This helps us get to know you a little bit better as well as answer any questions that you might have. We also just want to take a minute to say thank you so much to everybody that gives at City Church. Because of your radical generosity, we get to do what we do here and we are so grateful. If you would like to be a part of what God is doing financially through City Church, you can text GIVE to the number on your screen or you can click the link in the chat on the online platform. Remember, you are not just giving to a church, you're giving through a church. Some quick announcements for you guys. Here at City Church, we believe that prayer is the first response, not the last resort. So if you or anybody that you know of needs prayer, our staff and our pastors would be honored to pray for you. So you can click the link in the chat on the online platform or text prayer to the number below. Growth Track, this is our Next Steps class where you can learn a little bit more about who we are, what we're all about, and how to get plugged in. So you can text GROW to the number on your screen or click the link in the chat on the online platform and we will get you more information on that. We also have city groups continuing to meet throughout this season. We have groups on Sundays, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. We would love to get you connected and encouraged in this season. Just because we are socially distancing does not mean that we have to relationally distance. So you can click the link in the chat on the online platform or text group to the number below. Lastly, City Church continues to be a church that is in the city and for the city. Please feel free to reach out with any needs, ideas, or opportunities that you may know of so we can serve our city well together during this time. Thank you guys so much again for being here. Enjoy the service. Awakens, awakens me. 
business, business. I guess I gotta be the one to see the summer. Who really in this, in this? Uh, we so fed up. My life, 10 up. Your time, been up. Big prayers, send up. Uh, couldn't do without him, out of him. Uh, glad that I found him, found him. Uh, crowd really wild, wild. Uh, I'm kicking it, shallow, shallow. Hey guys, welcome to City Church. It's such an honor to have you joining us for week two of Chasing Carrots. And by the way, happy late Thanksgiving and a huge shout out to all of you who participated in Food for Families because of your radical generosity. We had the privilege of serving 58 families with a Thanksgiving meal over the last week. Put your hands together. So cool and amazing. And here's what's awesome is collectively across Boulder and the other organizations and churches churches that we partnered with, we served over a thousand families together. Isn't that amazing? Guys, so, so cool. So thank you for being a radically generous church. Such an honor and a privilege to be a part of this together. Hey, so I don't know what the holiday season looks like for you. I hope that you had at least some kind of interaction over the Thanksgiving holiday that maybe you, even, even if it was just a Zoom call, that you had something and, and a time to invest in relationships and enjoy someone's company. For me, typically, it looks a little bit different this year, but, but one of the things that I love to do anytime there's a holiday, is to get together with family, you know, share a meal, things like that. But then uh, we like to play board games, card games, and, and, and things in that category. Just kind of enjoy each other's company and hang out. The, the challenge for me, and I don't, I don't know where you fall into this category, is um, I, I like to quote the great theologian Ricky Bobby when I play board games and card games, and that is this, that if you're not first... You're last, that, that you play to win. And so, yes, it's meant to be fun, and yes, it's meant to be engaging, but I'm absolutely there to play to win. And uh, it wasn't long ago that we were hanging out with some of our friends, Danielle and I, and uh, we had our friends Colton and Madeline over, and we were playing this board game called Settlers of Catan. And um, again, goal is to play to win, right? We're having a good time, we're connecting, it's great. And Madeline asks for something, some cards out of my hand, and I conveniently leave out the whole truth about what's in my hand. And so it was a few rounds later that she discovers that I lied to her about what was in my hand, and she was just, I mean, appalled. She was like, oh, my pastor lied to me. And I'm like, listen, it's permissive within the game. Character doesn't count in the middle of a game, right? Like, play to win. Or, or this last weekend, man, we were um, at a, at a uh, an escape room with some of our team members, and, uh, and we split it up. It was guys against girls, two different escape rooms. Whoever finished first was going to be the winner, uh, whoever had the most time on the clock. And so uh, uh, we had like three minutes and some change left on the clock. We completed the two objectives. The guy, the owner, comes in, and he's like, congratulations, you did it. And then as we're walking out, we're like, hey, we have this extra key. What does it go to? And he's like, you shouldn't have an extra key. <laughs> and so then he closes the door and starts the clock again. And there was a little bit of confusion. What happened is we accidentally broke a lock and uh, got the objective anyway. Um, but because of that, he ran the clock and we got out. And as we come out, he said, hey, congratulations. You, built, you, you beat the time, but the girls beat you by 10 seconds. But then he says this statement that drives me crazy. He's like, well, but technically you got the objective first, but then we ran the clock. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. There, there is no technically here. There, there is winners and there's losers. And now he's put us in this paradigm where the girls think they won and I know we won and it puts us in this position where we're never going to be able to know the truth because he didn't do his job. Little, little frustrated. Just kidding. Okay, so playing to win. Now, I, it's all lighthearted. I really enjoy uh, um, just having fun. I don't mind losing, by the way, as long as I know emphatically that I lost, right? I can, I can take the hits. But in that moment, it was like, oh, we kind of lost and kind of won? Like, that's, not, that's unacceptable. You can't kind of win and lose. There is no participation trophy here. All right, part of my competitive nature. Sorry, I got excited. Part of my competitive nature, it comes from a spirit of perfectionism. And, and while it's lighthearted in most arenas, there, there's some times that I still struggle genuinely in, in certain areas. And, and, and you and I tend to think of perfectionism probably in a single category of like super OCD organized people who like color code their closets and, you know, just have everything laid out in a very certain way. Like all their pencils are in a very specific cup holders and right, they, they have very organized details about their life. But while, I, while that's definitely a, a category of perfectionism, it plays out in a lot of different ways. And we're going to talk about that today. And so in light of the holidays, right, for some of you, you're going to be around a lot of people and you're hosting, maybe ho hopefully not too many people in light of COVID, but... 
you know, you're hosting and you're entertaining and you're serving. And so there's a pressure on to perform and to, to have a certain environment that you create as you serve others. For some of you, it's the end of the year and deadlines are there at work and you, man, the pressure is on to deliver on those deadlines. It's big sale time and all of those things going on. For some of you, you got marketing deadlines that are coming up. Our team is feeling that immensely around Christmas and so having everything done right and the pressure that gets put on about delivering and performing well. Some of you, this is going to be like your baby's first Christmas and, and, and maybe your first time parents. And so there's that like pressure to have the best first Christmas and the, the perfect first family photo of your first Christmas. And right, There's all of this pressure around perfectionism. And for me, just, just to be totally transparent, um, I, I genuinely struggle with what you think, for example. There, there's this pressure for me around perfectionism of, man, am I communicating well? Uh, it, do, do people understand me? Does the content get across? Is this helpful? Are you able to do something with it? I, I think about what you think of me um, in, in the way that I perform, if you will. Um, not only that, but then I, I, there's a pressure of like, man, what does God think of me? Because it's not just about... Uh, how this message comes across, but man, I want to honor God in the process, not only in using my gifts, but in my whole life. I'm thinking, oh man, am, am I honoring God with my life and my marriage and my kids and my job and, and my neighboring and all those things? And then on top of that, I, I've got myself to live up to, right? I don't know what kind of struggle you're in, but man, sometimes my own expectations are just so crushing and so frustrating. And the irony of this conversation is you and I can get stuck in our heads around the pressure we put on ourselves, but then when someone else messes up, when someone else falls short, what do we say? Oh, hey, don't worry about it. No one's perfect, right? No, no one's perfect. And, and it's so funny that we're willing to say that for others, but then in our own life, we have these unrealistic expectations that we hold ourselves to. And when we fall short, because we do, we, we, we feel shame and we, get, we feel guilt and we're frustrated and, and defeated. And, and here, here's the deal is it doesn't stop there because then you go to Jesus and, and, you know, we hopefully are looking for some encouragement from Jesus. But then Jesus says stuff like this in Matthew 5. He's like, hey, but you are to be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. No big deal. No pressure. Just be perfect like God. You got this. You know, and I was thinking about this conversation, and I was like, man, this is such a heavy and hard conversation, perfectionism. And I'm like, man, you, you know the only people on the planet who, who have it easy? Like, the only people who stand a chance of, of being perfect are moms, right? Like, think about it. Moms, you have, you have it so easy. All you have to do is have, like, a Pinterest-worthy home, and, and all you have to do is, is you know, have Instagram-worthy looks, and, and, and all you have to do is throw elaborate birthday parties for all of your children, and you have to cultivate hobbies on the side while also taking your kids to the park and to the grocery store and to the playground and to the zoo. And on top of that, you, you've got to make regular posts of all those activities on Instagram and social media so that everyone knows how amazing of a mom you are in addition, you got to work out five times a week to keep up the Instagram look that you're trying to maintain. And on top of that, you've got laundry, you've got to read books, you've got to say prayers, you've got to sing songs, you've got to create memories, you've got to feed your kids and not just, just feed them like enough to survive, but like the organic kale infused, amazing, you know, zero calories, but absolutely healthy for them, terrible tasting. I'm sorry, where are we going with this? I, I'm clearly scarred. But right, moms, you guys have it so easy. Is it tongue in cheek? Okay, R clearly moms have the hardest job in the world. But here's the deal it, it doesn't stop there, right? Because if you're a mom who works, you start to feel guilty because you're working and you're not at home with your kids. <laughs> and then the opposite is true. If you're a mom who's at home with your kids, you start to feel guilty because you don't want to be at home with your kids. And then also in the background, you have this degree that you probably worked for that you're not using, and so you feel frustrated and guilty and ashamed about that, right? Moms have it hard. Now, listen, this is an all-of-us problem, right? There's this standard of performance and perfection that we have from our culture, that we have from others, and that we have from ourselves, and it doesn't stop. And on top of that, our culture praises the grind, right? Our culture praises your performance under pressure, that even if you lose a little bit of your soul in the process, this is what it takes to be successful. This is what it takes to be significant. And you know the pressure. But before we move on, I want to take some time and look at perfectionism and define it because I think if we're not careful, we can think of people like this and not look at ourselves, but the, the goal today is not to give you ammo to point at someone else and tell them to stop being a perfectionist. The goal is to look in the mirror and evaluate our own selves. So let's, t let's take a look at three different perfectionists. The first one is the self-oriented 
perfectionist. And I just want you to look for yourself in these three different examples, okay? This person, uh, if, if you fall, fall into this category, you hold unrealistically high expectations of yourself. And you battle with feelings of guilt, often obsessing to the point of inefficiency, right? It's like, why even try so I don't have to worry about failing, right? You, you are prone typically to, to procrastination, and you struggle with deep feelings of inadequacy, Self-oriented struggle, right? You see, you see the difference? Let's go to the externally oriented person. If you're ex- externally oriented as a perfectionist, you believe others, this is so important, you believe others expect you to be perfect. And to cope with that pressure, you often use self-deprecating humor as a defense. You make fun of yourself in order to kind of let the pressure off a little bit, even though it's still really damaging to you on the inside. You often feel alone, maybe this is you, depressed and desperate because you know that you're never going to be enough to measure up. And the last person that we see in this category is the others-oriented perfectionist. And this person imposes their expectations on others. And, and maybe you grew up in a home like this. Maybe uh, um, you are a person like this. I, I know I struggle with this at times. And, and here's the challenge here is... is I put my expectations on other people, and because I tend to lack empathy, I'm just going to use myself as an example, I can often tear other people down or or use abrasive and demeaning humor toward those who don't meet my standards. You see, perfectionism takes a root in a lot of different ways, and while there's absolutely psychological components that that tend toward perfectionism, and while there's definitely past influences that cause us to behave a certain way, odds are you feel this pressure in in different ways, and maybe even all of them collectively at times or in different seasons. But here's what I want you to to wrestle with me today. Um, is, Is at its root, I believe this is a spiritual problem. And if it's a spiritual problem, I I believe that there's going to be a spiritual solution that you and I can lean into. And so even if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'd like you to just kind of lean in and see maybe a solution that you've never thought of. Maybe it's way more practical than you realized as we lean into this conversation. But let's define perfectionism before we move on. Perfectionism is a cover-up. It's a cover-up for our deepest fears, insecurities, imperfections, and to coin a term Jesus would like to use, our, our sinfulness. And you might not like that word, but that's okay. Um, you can put whatever you want in there, messed up, broken, jacked up, whatever. We're, we're, all of us have something, right? So it's a cover-up. And I want you to think back to, maybe you've heard the story before in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, it's kind of the creation story, and we have God make this perfect world, and Adam and Eve are perfect, and there's no sin in the world, and they have a pressureless environment, not like atm- atmospheric because they couldn't survive, but like there's no pressure on their lives as far as um, performing. Because there's no sin and they're perfect. But then when, when they choose to sin, when they choose to disobey God, there's a moment where they become aware of their own flaws and insecurities. In that moment, when they sin, they become aware of their nakedness. And what, what do they do in Genesis 1 and 2 and, and 3? That They find some, some fig leaves and they cover up their nakedness. Right? Perfectionism, it, it's, a, it's to cover myself up. Why? So I can create an appearance. Don't miss this. I'm trying to create an appearance so that you don't see my imperfections and my brokenness. Does it make sense? I want to show you what I think you want to see. That's the root of this issue of perfectionism. And let me just give you the the bad news, because it doesn't just apply to our performance around our relationships here, but this ultimately is rooted in how we think we relate with God, that if we can hit Whatever X mark is, right, we have a standard that we have set or other people have set, and we think if we can perform at this level, we're we're worthy and valuable and lovable. The problem is you and I consistently fall short of our standards and the standards of others. And so let's look at Romans chapter 3. This is Paul writing a super encouraging passage here. He says this in Romans chapter 3. He says, hey, guys, no one can ever be made right with God by doing with the law commands, right? There's not enough performance in you and I in order to be made right with God. There's not enough where God finally looks and says, way to go, gold star, you're finally a good enough person. And he's referring to the law, which is given in the Old Testament, and he says this about the law. The law simply shows us, get this, this is crazy. It simply shows us how sinful that we are, right? So, I mean, you can take the 600 plus laws that we see 
uh, cultivated over time, or just like the Big Ten, the Big Ten Commandments, right? Even if you're not a church person, maybe you heard that before, the Ten Commandments, right? And if you just kind of walk through the list, it doesn't take long before you and I start to fall short of those standards. I, I, and I'll just be honest, right? I don't, I don't know that I meet even one of them, <laughs> right? And so the point of the law, Paul says, is, is not so that we have a target to shoot at, but rather to show us that no matter how hard we try, we can't hit that target. You're like, well, that's encouraging. Thanks, God. for, for... And this is, this is hard because we live in a culture that says, hey, don't judge me. Right? I'm a good person. Don't, don't tell me I'm a bad person. We don't like bad news, and we don't like hard-hitting news, and we, we like to think we're good people. But listen, this is not a judgment conversation. This is just a truthful conversation. You and I, we're jacked up people, right? You know that, right? Like there's some serious dysfunction on the inside of this guy, and it's the same for you. No matter how benevolent you are, or how much good stuff you do, or how much self-control you have, you still have some jacked up areas in your life. We all fall short of the standard of perfection that God sets before us, and that's what it takes to even have a relationship with him. Here's the challenge. Until you and I see ourselves as sinners, even if we don't like that word, you can insert brokenness or whatever, until you and I see ourselves as sinners, we, we don't see a need for a savior. Right? You see this gap? This is why the religious people had such a hard time with the message of Jesus, because they didn't think they needed it. But when you and I can just be honest, not even with anybody else, just ourselves, <laughs> and say, okay, maybe I don't have it all together. I don't think it takes much. But here's the question, because obviously we don't want to end on a, on a low note, but how are, how are we made right with God? Because this is not exactly encouraging. Guys, listen, this is such good news that you and I need to hear it over and over again. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's never a point in your life where this is not good news. We need to be reminded over and over again. It's like the practice of Thanksgiving over the holidays, right? What are you doing? Cultivating gratitude for things that you should already be grateful for. You just get in the habit of being ungrateful. And you got to remind yourself in the same way we need to hear the good news over and over again. So this might be the first time you're hearing good news, man, lean in. But it might be the hundredth time you're hearing it, lean in. Because I needed it just as much this morning as anyone else. Check it out. Paul goes on and he says, hey, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him. It's, it's as black and white as it gets. Without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith, our trust in Jesus. And this, listen, is true for everyone who believes no matter who we are, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how good or bad you think your performance is. And guys, this is so important. We're not made right by religious effort. We're not made right by good works. We're not made right by a list of things that we're going to stop doing. We're not made right by joining a church. We're not made right by reading the Bible. We're made right by Jesus. That's it. This is such good news. It's just Jesus, not Jesus plus anything. It's always going to be Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It's just Jesus. His death on the cross in our place for our sins was the death you and I deserve. And when he rose from the grave, he did what you and I can't do. He overcame sin, death, and the devil. And he gives anyone new life who would choose to trust in him, making us right with God and reconciling us to one another. And this is such amazing news. Because when you, when you and I can press into this, when, when you and I can press into this good news, it sets us free from the trap of perfectionism. So let, let me break it down for you really quick so you can see it. Just if we were going to kind of contrast perfectionism versus grace. Perfectionism is about what I do. Grace is about what Jesus has done for me. Perfectionism is about me and my performance, and my ability, and my track record. Grace is about Jesus and what he has done. It's what I'm receiving even though I don't deserve it. Perfectionism is if I obey, God will love me. It's performance-based affection and relationship. Grace says because God loves me, I can obey. This is so important. Listen, for those of you that Jesus followers, you got to remind yourself, like, why do I want to follow and love and serve God? Because it's not necessarily easier all the time, right? But the motivator changes that love is the motivation. Perfectionism is about winning God's approval. 
and the approval of others. Grace is about living from God's approval. It's a complete identity shift. Guys, listen, because of Jesus, the pressure is off. Because of Jesus, the pressure is off. And so when you're incredibly insecure, like me, and when you want to impress everyone with your performance, this conversation removes that pressure. And guys, it shouldn't just change the way that we think. It should, it should change the way that we live. Do you agree? Right? It should change the way that we behave, that our belief should inform and determine our behavior. So because the pressure is off, guys, listen, this is so important. Because the pressure is off, we have the permission to choose people over perfection. We get to choose people over perfection. We get to choose intimacy in relationships over our performance. We, we get to choose depth of connection over performance. And, and here's what this looks like, okay? Um, if you come to my house, th th there's a season I, I put a heavy pressure uh, in my home, both personally and on my family, to have it looked a, cer a certain way, right? Like the pillows all have to be in their place, and it's all vacuumed up because we have dogs, and you, you know, we don't have dog hair everywhere, and there's a candle lit, so there's like a nice scent when you walk in. And man, just over and over again, like the pressure is crushing my family, right? As you have little kids and you have a dog and you have all the things that are happening in life, it's impossible to keep your house clean. And so Danielle and I start having conversations about, man, what does it look like to be hospitable and to love others and to welcome them into our homes without having to put a face on of like, life is, is always just this perfect, you know, pillows are never out of alignment. Blankets are always folded. There's never a messy cabinet or a messy table or, or a messy kitchen, right? It's always absolutely perfect. Well, we made the decision to start to prioritize people over performance. We don't do this perfectly, by the way, but what it looks like is that regardless of, of what's going on in our life, you're going to be invited into our home and you're just going to get the real love and the real us in the process. And so here's what that means. If you come over to my house today, most of you probably are, have already experienced this, um, there's going to be pillows missing, right? Who knows where they are? They're going to be out of alignment. There's going to be, uh, you know, maybe um, uh, the smell of a candle, but it's because it's masking the smell of a poopy diaper, right? Um, and so it's just like vanilla and poop is normally the, the flavor that you're getting. Um, there might be, you know, a pair of underwear laying on the floor somewhere. It won't be mine, um, but it's probably my kid's. Um, and there might be a kid running around in his underwear or without underwear. I mean, you never know when you come over to my house. It's a gamble. Um, there's probably, just to be transparent, there's probably going to be pee on the toilet. Okay? It's not my pee. Um, it's not Danielle's pee. <laughs> but there's probably going to be pee on the toilet. Okay? Um, but, but here's the deal. We're going to invite you into the real space regardless of what's going on. And we're going to really love you and choose people over performance. Does this make sense to you? In the same way, we can choose perfect love over perfect performance. And again, that, that perfectionism conversation is it's a covering of our fears, our insecurities. Let me ask you a question. What's yours? Where does inadequacy, where does shame, where does guilt, where does fear, where, where does all that come from for you? And where does the pressure of perfectionism come from? Earlier, I, I showed you a verse, right, where Jesus said, hey, you need to be perfect like God is perfect. And I intentionally gave you that verse out of context to freak you out a little bit, and also to teach you a lesson that um, we shouldn't use the Bible out of context, right? That context is king. And so in light of that text, uh, Jesus is actually talking about elevating love. He says, hey, you've heard that it said just love your neighbor, and that's easy when you like the people around you. But he says, I, I say you should even love your enemy. And Jesus, in this context about being perfect, is having a conversation about allowing love to be the dominant reality in our lives. And, and even more importantly, that word perfect that we see in the text is translated better. Uh, uh, for us, it's going to be more like complete and mature, okay? So, so not perfect like as in a standard and as in performance, but what Jesus is saying in that context is, hey, let love mature in your life. Let love bring about completion in your life. Let love be the focal point. Elevate love over performance. And again, this is so amazing because it's not about behavior, it's not about behavior. It's not about performance, but it's our response to God's love. Jesus is teaching us, hey, God loves you in such a way that you have the ability now to extend it to others. So grow in your love. Mature in your love of others and your love of God. Grow and be complete in that reality. It's being perfected in love, not, not, be, not having perfect performance in the way that we love. 
And this is finally starting to, to click for me because I don't know about you, but man, I, I struggle with feelings of, of inadequacy. And, and when I'm met with that, it makes me want to work harder and perform harder to prove that I'm not inadequate. But guys, listen to me. My calling is not to, to convince others of how good I am. That's the root and the, the issue of perfectionism. My calling is not to convince others of how good I am. My calling is to convince others of how good God is. You see the difference? The whole motivation, the whole paradigm shifts in this moment. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. I don't have to perform for God's favor or the favor of anyone else. I have the privilege of loving others and resting in a relationship with God. The pressure is off. And Paul goes on to say later in Romans 5, 8, that, that Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We simply receive it. And for some of you, you're, you're not followers of Jesus. You've been leaning into this conversation and you've been evaluating your stance and your belief and your faith in God and, and, and just maybe your, your background and what you've experienced. And, and I don't know where you're walking in, but maybe, maybe you've had some motivations around guilt and shame and, and what it takes to be made right with God. And I just want to encourage you, listen, it's just Jesus. It's simply faith in Jesus. And maybe for the first time today you're realizing that God has you here. God has you in this conversation not to change your behavior but to change what you believe. Not because behavior doesn't matter but because the motivation changes. That our belief begins to change our behavior. Maybe for the first time you're realizing that you don't have to earn a relationship with God, but that you simply get to receive it. And if you're at a place right now where you say, Drake, man, I'm ready to start a relationship with Jesus. I'm ready to say yes and move in that direction. You can text in the word follow to the number on the screen. We would love to help you take some next steps, answer any questions you might have. And for those of you that are followers of Jesus and you're leaning in and you struggle with perfectionism and you struggle with uh, uh, external pressures and internal pressures, I want you to reflect with me on how we're going to change this conversation this week. A couple of uh, reflection things for you. What area, what area do you hear Jesus inviting you to take the pressure off? Where are you robbing yourself of joy, robbing yourself of relationships, robbing yourself of progress because of the pressure of perfection? What's Jesus putting his hand on today? Where are you letting perfection get in the way of people? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's when you have people over. Maybe it's family members as they come in for the holidays. Where are you letting perfection get in the way of people? And here's my question for you. How are you going to flip it this week? How are you going to flip it for Christmas? How are you going to flip it over the next couple of weeks as you engage with people and there's a natural pressure that comes along with it? How do you elevate that reality? And the last thing is this. How will you elevate perfect love over performance this week? How can you let that pressure come off and press into the reality and the invitation from Jesus to press into love? Complete, mature, growing love because of the love of God working in and through you. Guys, we're here for you. We'd love to serve you. Can't wait to connect with you. See you soon. Thank you so much for watching. We would love to connect with you and help you take next steps in whatever way is best. Just text that number on the screen and our team will be sure and follow up with you.